Well, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. In the spring of 2022, we set out on a journey to walk through the book of Matthew together. And we started this uh, series that we called um, Here Comes the Kingdom, because Matthew is all about the arrival of the kingdom of God in the world. And, and then when we got to Matthew chapter 5, we entered into a segment of the scripture that is known as the Sermon on the Mount. It's a long sermon that Jesus preached that actually takes up three chapters, chapter 5, 6, and 7. And so we kind of have done a, a little mini-series through the Sermon on the Mount that we've called the Upside Down Kingdom because it's really in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus takes a lot of the people's ideas about what it looks like to live for God and live in a relationship with others, and he kind of turns them on their head. And so uh, this is the Upside Down Kingdom series that we're in the middle of now. And uh, so we're just jumping into chapter 7 here. We've taken a couple of months off for Christmas and then our January series talking about how God has more for us this year. But now we're back into Matthew, and I've been looking forward to this, excited to get back into God's Word. Um, this, is, uh, this series through Matthew is something that's really important because I think when we walk verse by verse through a book of the Bible, it, it, it just steeps us in this part of God's Word. And it gives God an opportunity to speak to us in a unique way. And you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can pray, and you should. You should come to church, and you are, so good job, kudos to you for that. Uh, you can love people, you can do all kinds of wonderful things. You can serve, you can give, but at the end of the day, there is one thing that has more power to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ than anything else, and that is reading God's Word, hearing God's Word, taking in God's Word. And so I want to encourage you today, if you want to start your 2023 off right, you want to go deeper into a relationship with God than you've ever been before, you want to be a better person than you've ever been before, make this the year of God's Word for you. I mean, I'm just, it's the, it, it is the one thing that has more power than anything else to change your life. And so get yourself into God's word. One of the ways you do that is by coming to church on Sunday, and we are walking through Matthew together. Some people have asked me, why Matthew? Why are we going through Matthew verse by verse? There's all these other books of the Bible. The simple answer to that is, I believe that's what God told me to do. So it, it was in August of 2021, four months before I became the pastor of ET, I was sitting at my kitchen table one morning, and I was praying and spending time with the Lord, and I feel like the Lord spoke to me and said, when you become the pastor of ET, the first thing you have to do is take the church through the book of Matthew verse by verse. And it was so clear to me that I wrote it down in my journal that day. I was like, wow, that's okay, that's very specific. And so that's what we've done. Now, we're, you know, we'll do a few other things along the way here as well, like our, our Christmas series and then the series last month, but, but we're jumping back into Matthew, and I'm telling you, we're, we're going to go to Matthew until, you know, Jesus comes back or until we get done with it, you know, whichever happens first. So we're, we're, we're in Matthew until further notice, okay? So Matthew is a great book, and one of the reasons Matthew is so good is because Matthew tells us all about the kingdom of God, which was the central teaching of Jesus, Matthew tells us. And then not only does Matthew tell us about the kingdom of God, Matthew describes for us the king of the kingdom and what he's like, and that's Jesus. And then Matthew goes one step further, and he describes for us what it, what it should be like for you and I to live as citizens of the kingdom of God under the kingship and rulership of the king of the kingdom, Jesus Christ. So Matthew kind of has the whole package, and that's why I'm great, we're, uh, really grateful that we're in Matthew. And one of the verses that I've gone back to repeatedly over the last year when I've talked about this issue of the kingdom of God is Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. And this is what it says. For he has rescued us, the he is God here, God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. That's Jesus Christ. So God saves us, and when he saves us, he pulls us out of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of the world, and he puts us into a relationship with Jesus. That's the kingdom of Jesus, the, the kingdom of light. And the, the truth is, you and I have a choice to make about which kingdom we want to be a part of, which kingdom we want to live in. And my hope is that you choose to live in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And in order to do that, what you have to do is you have to submit to his authority. You have to submit to his rule. You have to submit to his reign. And many of you in this room have chosen to do that. As a matter of fact, many of you chose to do that a long, 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 long time ago. And you have lived for a long time in the benefit 
of the kingdom of God. You have received the blessings of living in God's kingdom. But if you have not made that choice today, whether you're here in the room or watching online, I want you to know, I'm just giving you a heads up, that at the end of this message, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to step out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Because there's no more important decision that you can make in your life than that. Every single one of us choose which kingdom we wanna be a part of. And by the way, you don't have an option not to choose. Even your not choosing is choosing to be a part of the kingdom of darkness. And so today, the most important decision you can make is choose, choosing to be a part of the kingdom of of Jesus. So we, we get into Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and we find that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' primary teaching, though he talks a lot about God, of course, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, the primary thrust of his teaching is really about how we're to live in relationship with other people, particularly other disciples of Jesus. And so we're going to pick up Jesus' teaching here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. And this is what he says, do not judge others and you will not be judged for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. So Jesus starts off with this really basic principle of human relationships, which is the way that you treat others is the way they're going to treat you. And Jesus is actually going to dive way deeper into this in verse 12 of Matthew chapter seven. So we'll be there in a couple of weeks in the section of scripture that's come to be known as the golden rule. And that is that we are to treat others in the way that we would like for them to treat us. But in this particular passage in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus, I think, is talking about more than just human relationships. That if we treat somebody else with judgment, if we judge others, they will judge us. I think he's talking about more than just that. I actually think that he's talking about our relationship with God. And what he is saying is, in the same way that we judge others, God will judge us. This is actually a really prominent recurring theme in Jesus' teaching, particularly in the book of Matthew. Just one chapter earlier in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, if you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. But if you forgive others, God will forgive you. So Jesus does a really great job of tying our horizontal human relationships, interpersonal relationships, into our vertical relationship with God. He's saying that those two things are connected. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, he's saying, if we judge others, or in the same way we judge others, God will judge us. And then Paul echoes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. This is what it says. Paul says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So both Jesus and Paul tell us, don't judge. Don't take God's place as judge. That's really what they're saying. Because eventually, God will judge every human being. And he's the only one who has the ability to show our lives for what they really are, to lay bare the motives and intent and purposes of our heart. And so if we try to judge others now, we are actually taking God's place in ju as judge and pushing him off of his judgment seat. But this whole judging thing can be really confusing in the New Testament, and here's why. Because in Matthew chapter seven, Jesus says, don't judge others. And in 1 Corinthians chapter four, Paul says, don't judge others. But then just one chapter later in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, do judge others. This is what he says. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those who are outside. Purge the evil person from among you. That's really strong language from Jesus. So should we judge others or not? The answer is yes. We, we should judge others and we shouldn't judge others. What Paul is saying is, in this, in, in, uh, in this particular passage, he's saying, don't judge outsiders. Don't judge non-Christians. Don't judge people who don't know the Lord. This is, this is going to help some of you. It's going to free some of you up. Quit getting all twisted and sideways about stuff that sinners do. You can't expect a sinner to live up to the standard of God's word. They're not a follower of Jesus don't get all twisted and sideways because, you know, 
they use language that you wouldn't use, and they partake in activities that you wouldn't do, and they, they do all the, the evil stuff of the world. What do you expect them to do? They're sinners, heathens, whatever you want to call it. They, they're, they're not following God. So Paul is saying, don't judge them. That's God's business. That's God's position to judge them, and God will take care of that. But now what, what Paul's doing in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is he's writing a letter to the Corinthian church, and specifically in chapter 5, he is addressing the fact that there's a person in the church in Corinth that's living a sexually immoral lifestyle, and everybody in the church knows it. Even Paul knows it who doesn't live with them. That's how bad it is. That's how big it is. Even the word has gotten to Paul about this sexually immoral lifestyle, and Paul says, you all cannot continue to let that go on. You've got to judge that as the people of God. And what he means by that when he says you have to, have to judge it is he's saying you have to confront it. You have to call it out. So Paul says that within the church, we have a responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ to, to call out when brothers and sisters are living in blatant rebellion and sin. Now, we have to do that lovingly. We have to do that compassionately. We have to, we, we, we can't just make a, you know, be mean about it. We have to bring correction. But that is a form of judgment, Paul says. We are, we are judging others because we are evaluating something to determine if it's good or bad. Is it, is it right or wrong? Is it light or dark? So the question for us today is, is Paul contradicting himself when in one passage he says don't judge and in the very next chapter he says do judge? No, he's not contradicting himself. What he's saying is there are some things as the body of Christ that we have to judge and there are other things that we cannot judge. We must judge a fellow believer who's living in sin. And by by judging, again, we're talking about bringing loving correction. But he's saying the things that we are not to judge as believers is, number one, we should not judge outsiders because that's God's business to deal with. The other thing that we are not to judge is we we should not judge people in the church who are dealing with non-sin issues, but they're just doing things we don't like, things that are personality preferences, personality differences, judging people's motives, which we really can't know because we, we can't know the motives of people's hearts. So Paul says... We should not be judging outsiders, and we should not be judging insiders who are not living in sin. They're just living different than we would. So this is how Jesus puts it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. He's, he's going to give a kind of a, 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 an illustration, a word picture here. It's kind of funny. He says uh, in verse 3, And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye, when you can't see past the log in your own eye. Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Now, you don't have to be a genius to figure out what Jesus is saying here, but I mean, let's just put it in our context. Have you ever had somebody in your life that is just constantly picking on you? They're constantly criticizing you. You you can't ever do right in their eyes. You can't ever be good enough. You can't ever live up to their level of expectation. We, we all have people like that in our lives. But the worst, the very worst, is when you have somebody who's being constantly critical of you. And the whole time while they're being critical of you, you're thinking in your mind of them, what are you talking about? You're just as bad. You're even worse than me. Maybe it's a coworker who says, you know, you really need to pick it up and work a little harder. And you're thinking to yourself, you're the laziest person I know. What are you talking about? You know, so... We all, we all have people like that that they criticize or they judge, and we're thinking to ourselves, my goodness, this is like the pot calling the kettle black. We live in a world of judgment, though. And maybe it's always been like this, people judging each other, criticizing each other, critiquing each other. But, I, but now, in the world that we live in today, it just seems like it's just magnified because everybody with a phone and a social media account 
can say anything they want about anybody they want for any reason they want, and they can criticize and call out and judge, and now you, you flip on the TV stations and you go to any of the news channels and they're screaming and yelling about so-and-so did something that they don't like and they don't agree with, and, and it's just like we live in a world of division and criticism and judgment. And we do this in our own personal relationships as well, unfortunately. We, we nitpick people, we, we question people's motives, and... There are some people, not saying this is any of you, but there are some people that if somebody in your life does something you don't agree with, they make a decision you don't like, they, maybe they lead their organization or their area in a way that you don't like, or they make a decision in their personal life that you wouldn't have made if it was you, you feel this internal need to bring correction Maybe we could say it like this. You have a deep internal sense of justice and you're thinking to yourself, somebody needs to say something about this. Somebody needs to bring correction. Somebody needs to call this person out for what they've done. But it's interesting that what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7 is so powerful, it's so precise, it's, it's so to the point. And I, I would think that it, it probably would have landed so hard on his audience that they would have either gasped when he said this or maybe even laughed when he said it, when he gave this illustration about trying to point out the speck in your friend's eye while you have a, a log in your own eye. And Jesus was speaking to a group of people who were often doing this. They were often being critical of others, you know, and people who thought they had the religious moral high ground to call out other people who were not living up to God's standard or living up to the rules the way things ought to be done. And Jesus calls them out and he says, quit judging. Stop being so judgy. Stop being so critical. Stop pointing out people's faults and failures. Not because you may not be right in what you're saying, but because your faults are just as bad or worse than theirs. So, this is a good word for us today, friends. The truth is, we have become experts at pointing out what's wrong with others and amateurs at knowing what's wrong with ourselves. Jesus paints this funny little picture in Matthew 7 of what it's like when we do that, when we, when we point out what's wrong with others. Um, Tyler, you're, you're sitting in a great place, buddy. Can you come up here and help me? Bring that with you, and bring that, yeah, bring that other stuff with you too, yeah. You didn't mean to sit there with that stuff, but thank you for doing that. This is Tyler Harris. He, he, uh, Tyler grew up in this church. Tyler uh, is on the worship team. You probably see him up here playing the guitar. He's an awesome guitarist, but he does lots of other stuff too. Great dude. Why are you going so far away from me? Come over here. Um, <laughs> you need to get to know Tyler. Tyler's a, 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 a really great guy. Uh, senior in high school, getting ready to graduate, move on with the rest of his life. Awesome stuff. Um, thank you for helping me today. So uh, Jesus talks about finding a speck in your friend's eye. And uh, anybody ever had something in your eye just hurts? I actually had something like that this week, and I could not find it. It was driving me nuts. And, and uh, there's nothing more painful than having something in your eye that you can't get out. It would be really hard for you to see a speck today. So I brought a, a bigger piece of wood. Here, hold that up, up to your eye. Imagine if you had that stuck in your eye. I mean, how painful would that be? That would be so terrible. What kind of friend would I be if I saw you, Tyler, and I said, and I didn't say anything. I was just like, hey, Tyler, how's it going, man? Um, because that's not normal. And so in Jesus, in his illustration, what he's saying, this, the speck in somebody's eye is, is a, a fault or a failure that they have, some way that they don't measure up to your expectations. And so he's saying, uh, you know, you, you could call out the speck in your friend's eye there, but he says you got to be careful because while they have a speck in their eye, you have a log in your eye. So just imagine if I'm coming up to Tyler and I'm saying, Tyler, buddy, I, you, you got a problem there. I, I don't know if you've noticed. You got, you got a little issue. And this is what, we, and see, as Christians, we're just, we're not trying to be judgmental. We're just trying to be helpful, right? And so this is what we do. Tyler, buddy, let me, let me help you with that. Tyler, Tyler, come on, man. I just, I want to I I help you deal with this problem that you've got in your eye. And then 
And then what we do is we, we end up not being helpful, we end up being hurtful. We end up doing things that we think are helpful, trying to point out what's wrong with other people because we're just, we call it constructive criticism. But it's not constructive criticism, it's just Jesus calls it being judgmental. So he says, stop judging people. Oh, sorry, got a little piece of wood on you there. So he says, stop being judgmental. Because the truth is, if I try to point out the speck in Tyler's eye while I have a log in my eye, I'm actually not in a very good place to help him because I can't get close enough to him to help. So what it does is it puts me in a position that all I can do is stand over here and criticize and judge and tell him what the problem is without being in a place to really be able to help him at all. So Jesus says, you gotta get rid of the log in your own eye first. You gotta examine yourself first. So then you can be in a position to be close enough to be helpful in relationship with others so that your helping can actually be helpful. Thank you. Appreciate you. And then in verse 5, Jesus, as he's teaching about this, he looks at the people and he, he says, you hypocrites. That's really a, a scathing rebuke from Jesus, and it's, it's one of his go-to rebukes, uh, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, as he is teaching people who are religious, who are trying to make sure that everybody else measures up and and, and follows the rules and meets the standards. He says, you're hypocrites because in your calling out other people for not measuring up, you're just making it so plain all the ways that you're not measuring up yourself. You have a log in your own eye. And so Jesus is not saying we shouldn't notice the speck in other people's eyes. It's hard not to notice, right? When you see something, uh, when you see a fault or a failure that somebody else, it's hard, it's hard not to notice. But Jesus actually isn't telling us to ignore those things. He's just saying before we do anything about the speck in our friend's eye, that we should look into ourselves first. We should do some self-examination and we should ask ourselves maybe a series of questions like this. How am I doing? Am I okay? Am I living right? Am I being the best version of myself? Am I addressing the faults and failures in my own life? Is there potentially a way that I'm living or acting or talking that might be coming across wrong to other people, that might be rubbing other people the wrong way, that might be offending people? Is it possible that the things that I criticize other people for, I am actually doing myself? Jesus' words are a plea for his people to be as critical with themselves as they are with others and as generous with others as we are with ourselves. You know, we're pretty generous with ourselves, typically. We like to overlook our own mistakes. We like to overlook our own faults, but we're quick to notice the faults of others. So Jesus is just saying, hey, be as critical of yourself as you are with others and as generous uh, with others as you are with yourself. And then once, you, once you've dealt with your own issues, once you've, once you've dealt with your own stuff, you can see clearly and you can be in a position to help others. And, and like I said, helping our brothers and sisters with their faults and failures, in other words, with the speck in their eye, is the goal. Because if I saw a splinter in Tyler's eye and I didn't try to help, that wouldn't be very loving of me, would it? So it is right for me to try to help. But I can only do that once I put myself in a position to actually be helpful. John Chrysostom, one of the early church fathers, said this, alluding to somebody who, had, who has done something wrong. He says, correct him, but not as a foe nor as an adversary exacting a penalty, but as a physician providing medicine. That's how God wants us to work with each other in the body of Christ. We don't call out each other to embarrass one another or to hurt one another, but to provide medicine, to provide healing. So when a brother or sister in Christ has some kind of speck in their eye, they have some kind of fault or failure or issue that they're dealing with, how we help is very important. And Jesus says we're not to judge, we are to help, but we have to put ourselves in a position to help. So here's four quick things that you can do to put yourself in a position to help others with the speck in their eye. And the first thing is this, regularly search your own heart. Let's be people who regularly search our own heart. Psalm 139 says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. 
Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Like I said, Jesus is going to, uh, God's going to judge us one day. The best thing that you and I can do to prepare for that now is to judge ourselves now. We have to be people who judge ourselves. Number two, we have to measure ourselves by God's word. Psalm 119 says this. Uh, the psalmist says, your laws please me. They give me wise advice. When, when uh, the psalmist is talking about the laws of God, he's talking, really referring to the, the whole word of God. And throughout Psalm 119, the whole chapter is about how wonderful and beautiful and awesome God's word is. And he uses words like God's word, God's laws, God's precepts, God's command. And they really all refer to the same thing, which is God's word to us. And the psalmist says, your laws please me. Your word pleases me. It's, it's helpful to me. It's beautiful to me. It gives me wise advice. It helps me to know how to live. So how do we judge ourselves? Well, we judge ourselves by God's word because it's God's word that helps us to know how to live up to the standard that God wants us to live. The third thing is this. We should examine ourselves collaboratively. Collaboratively. So, uh, Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen says, iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. This is a really important in a church community. Find somebody who loves the Lord and loves you. And go to them and talk to them and say, hey, you know what, I, I'm just trying to be better. I'm, I'm trying to live with the Lord better. I'm, I'm trying to be a better person. Would you help point out anything in me that needs correction? Anything that needs to be brought into alignment with God's word and God's ways? So examine yourself collaboratively. Don't do it on your own. Do it with other people who love you and love the Lord. And number four is this. You should judge yourself compassionately. In Proverbs chapter three, verse 11, the writer of Proverbs says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. God looks compassionately on us. God sees every speck in our eye. He's every log that we have in our eye, too. And even when we have the biggest of the big laws, logs sticking out of our eye, you know God never looks at, at you and says, what's wrong with you? Get your act together, dummy. God doesn't say that. God says, hey, you're my child. You're my son or my daughter. I don't want you to live that way. I want you to have a better kind of life. I want you to have a better relationship with me. I want you to be in a better position to relate to the other people around you, the family of God. Come to me, learn from me. I want to help you. That's how God deals with us, compassionately. I think God would want you to deal with compassionately with yourself as well. The truth is, if you examine yourself today, you know all of the flaws. Well, maybe not all of them, but you know a lot of them that you have. The truth is, you, you know more of the flaws of you than anybody else knows because you can see down deep inside into places that nobody else can see. It's easy to get down on yourself and say, man, I just, I'm never gonna get over this. I'm always gonna be bound to this. I'm always gonna be addicted to this. I'm always gonna have this problem. I've had it my whole life. This is the way I was raised. This is the way my parents were. And, and we can go on and on down the list, criticizing ourselves. But today, I don't think God would want us to do that. I think God would want us to look at ourselves wisely and compassionately. So, what do I think Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter seven? I, I just think he's saying this to us today. Number one, let's be a community of introspective disciples. By introspective, I mean we are people who first and foremost look into ourselves. We don't look at others. We don't point out the faults in others. We don't criticize. We look in here first and we say, God, fix me. Take care of me. Heal me. Do something new and different in me. Make me better. I want to be more like you. Let's be introspective. And then the second thing I, I think Jesus would tell us this morning from Matthew chapter 7 is let's never, ever, ever be an individual or a church that's known for judgment. 
reach so many people out there who won't ever come into a building like this on a Sunday morning because all they know of Christians is judgmentalism. People telling them what they've done wrong, which remember, isn't our job to tell unbelievers what they're doing wrong. That's God's job. Our job is to love and care and disciple. Lead them to Jesus. So let's be an introspective body of believers and let's be a group of people who don't criticize, don't judge, don't, don't point out people's faults and failures. But a church that does what Hebrews 10 says, we encourage one another, we spur one another on to love and good deeds as we see the day of Christ's return approaching. See, the truth is, the Bible says that one of these days Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, I don't want him to find me judging people, telling people everything they've done wrong. I want him to find me loving people, encouraging people, drawing people closer to Jesus. So today, let's do that. Let's be introspective, let's be loving and not critical. We're gonna take a, a couple of minutes here at the end of our time together and do that. We're gonna, be, we're gonna practice, uh, practice what we preach, practice what we talk about. We're gonna be introspective and we're gonna ask the Lord to point out anything in us. Um, sure, if there's sin there, we want the Lord to point that out, but we also want the Lord to point out anything that is offensive about us. And say, Lord, is there anything in my life it's causing stress and problems, tension in my relationships with other people. Maybe it's not a sin issue. Maybe it's just a way I handle myself, a way I carry myself, a, a way that I talk or a way that I act or a, a way that I go about my life making decisions and just, it's just offensive. It's, maybe it's rude. Maybe it's just not kind. Maybe it rubs people the wrong way. We want the Lord to point those things out to us. Those are the logs in our eye. And if the Lord will help us get those things out, we can be in a position to better love and help others. Let's take a minute and do that. I just encourage you to take a couple of quiet moments with the Lord right now and just ask him to search your heart. Lord, help us. Point out if there's any wicked ways in us, any sin. But also, Lord, if there's there's stuff in our life that is just offensive. If there's stuff that makes it hard for us to have good relationships with other people, point that out to us. Help us to know how we can change. This is one of the ways we respond to God's word. Sometimes responding to God's word is like, you know, jumping up and down and lots of hype and that's cool. But sometimes responding to God's word is just putting yourself in God's presence and kind of throwing yourself on his mercy and just saying, Lord, would you kind of lay my life open? Just, just show me where I'm wrong. Lord, show me where I'm hurting people by how I talk and how I act.
life, I want to encourage you just to continue to do that. Just you and the Lord. Kind of close yourself in and say, Lord, show me, show me, show me. Because I think the Lord can begin to reveal things to us. And if we'll if we try to escape from that too quickly, we'll miss what the Lord wants to do. So we should just keep pressing in. Lord, show me more. Show me more about my life and ways that I can be I just a better child of God, a, a, a live a more intimate relationship with you, but a way that I can represent you more fully to the world around, around me. So as you're examining yourself, I want to talk to a different group of people in here today. I, I said early on in the message that every single one of us have to choose which kingdom we're going to live in. Are we going to choose to live in the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of the devil, the kingdom of darkness, or are we going to choose to come into the kingdom of Jesus, the Son of God, the kingdom of light, kingdom of good, kingdom of right. Every single one of us have to make a choice. Some of you in the room have made that choice. And you've experienced all the benefits that come with living as a, a member of the kingdom of God, a citizen of his kingdom. That's awesome. You get to have relationship with God. You get, to, you get to have a confidence in your soul knowing that no matter what's happening here in life, that the Lord is with me. God is with me. And I'm living as a, a citizen of his kingdom now, but not just now. Even after I die, even after this whole world comes to an end, I get to continue living in the kingdom of God. It's an eternal kingdom. Some of you have not made that decision yet. You're still maybe trying to figure out what kingdom you want to live in. You'd very much like to continue do, do, doing your own thing, running your own life, making your own decisions. But coming into the kingdom of God means that you have to submit to God's rule and God's reign. You have to lay down the things that you want, lay down control of your life and say, God, I, I would want to live for you. And, and the way in to the kingdom of God is by submitting to the rule and reign of Jesus and by believing that Jesus is the Son of God who came to save the world from sin. But not just the world, he came to save you from sin and me. So, if you've never come into a relationship with Jesus before, if you've never submitted to his rule and reign, if you've never said, Jesus, I, I want to I know you more. I, I need forgiveness of my sin. If you've never, never done that, today would be a great opportunity to do that. I can't force you to do it, but boy, I'd sure encourage you to do it because there's no better decision you could ever make than to come into a relationship with Jesus. To recognize him as the king of the kingdom. So if that's you today and you've never, you've never come into a relationship with Jesus before, or maybe you did and it was a long, long time ago and you've been away from God and you have not been living for him, but today you wanna come back and make it right. You wanna, you wanna be in right relationship with God. If that's you today, I just wanna encourage you to raise your hand right where you're at. I'm not gonna embarrass you, but I do wanna pray for you. I wanna pray with you. Anybody, anywhere in the room, in the balcony, if you're watching online, you can do this too. Say, yes, I, wanna, I want a relationship with Jesus. I don't want to live on my own anymore. I, I don't want to live for myself. I, I want help. You see, friends, the truth of the matter is you can't do this life on your own successfully. You need help. And the help you need is found in Jesus. So one more time, if that's you, you want to start a relationship with Jesus today, just raise your hand right where you're at. If you're watching online, you can make a note in the comments. We'll connect with you. I don't see any hands. That means, as far as I can tell, that every person in this room is a believer in Jesus. It's awesome. I want to encourage you this week as you're out in the world with family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, people at school, I encourage you to be sharing your faith, having conversations with people who don't know Jesus, and then invite them to come to church with you. 
next Sunday. Because next Sunday, I'm gonna do this exact same thing. I'm gonna give an opportunity for people to come into a relationship with Jesus. And I would just love it if your friend or neighbor or coworker or, or fellow student, family member was here. But you know, friend, the, the fact of the matter is, you don't need to wait on me. You can lead them to the Lord anytime this week. I encourage you to be sharing your faith with people um, and bring them to church next Sunday after you've led them to the Lord, after you've led them into a relationship with Jesus and expose them to what a great church family, uh, family of God is really like. Would you stand with me today? Thank you for coming to church. Thank you for being a student of God's word, investing yourself in hearing from God's word. God is gonna lead us into a new place this year, friends, in 2023, a place not of being uh, critical, judgmental, pointing out people's faults and failures, but a church, we're gonna continue to be a church that loves people, a church that welcomes people, a church that is compassionate with people, both inside the family of God and outside. And I encourage you every single Sunday to come help us build that culture here by being kind to people, loving, loving people, invite people to sin with, uh, sit with you, and uh, God will bless you for it, I know that. Hey, can you do this with me? Let's just pray together at the end of the service here. I wanna say a blessing over you before you leave. Lord Jesus, these are your people and they are awesome. What a great church family to be a part of. What a great group of people that you're assembling here at Evangel Temple who love you and love other people. Help us to be a representative of you to the world this week. And I pray that your blessing and favor would rest on your people today in such a powerful way that when they walk out of here, no matter whether they go to a, a restaurant or a store or a school or a, a workplace or into their neighborhood, that people who meet them and encounter them and talk with them would say, there's something different about this person because these people walk in the authority of King Jesus and they represent the kingdom of God everywhere they go. Help us to live that way, to live faithfully for you in front of the world that's watching us. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, have a great week.